I welcome you all to this um, panel on um, a kind of a discussion about the, 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 the role of property rights um, in Texas water law and kind of where we are now. Um, Texas is viewed as, a, and I'm Kathleen Hartnett White. I'm di director of the at TPPF's Armstrong Center for um, Energy and the Environment. Um, before that, among a variety of things, I was chairman of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, which is the agency which um, issues surface water rights. Um, as and, and some of you may be um, more familiar with this than I am, and some may not. But Texas has two very different legal regimes um, on water rights, a, a separate one for groundwater than one for surface water. Um, in groundwater, and this is, I'm trying to think of how to summarize this so rapidly, um, the owner of the surface property has an ownership interest in the groundwater below his land. Uh, for decades, people just constantly characterized that as the rule of capture. Um, and as Texas population grew and there was more demand on groundwater, uh, lots of things went on in our legislature, but they um, uh, created authority to create local groundwater districts and wrote some general law on what was the, the scope of the regulatory authority of those local groundwater districts. Um, lots of kind of what for a long time I think was considered settled groundwater law started to kind of erode a little bit and people said landowner doesn't own the water in place. He only own, owns it when he captures it like wild game um, on a ranch. And um, there was a group of which TPPF was a kind of um, founding member that said the legislature really needs to clarify the property owner's right to groundwater because it is eroding. And it was um, quite a few years when in that discussion because when you try to take something like that on you take the risk of making it worse um, by what the the final legislation ends up to be indeed texas did two sessions ago clarify and strengthen i would call the legal scope of the surface uh, landowners uh, property interest in groundwater and put in very clear language it is a real private property right which among other things means it's protected by the US and Texas Constitution then not too long after that a very I think a milestone Texas Supreme Court case even further strengthened the, um, the the constitutional protection owed to a landowner's surface water right and in fact in the ruling of that case said that 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 right, the nature of that right or the scope of the right, by quoting a, um, a landmark uh, Supreme Court ruling for oil and gas, and in fact said that the nature and scope of the surface landowners um, is, is largely equivalent, not 100 percent, to the um, surface owner's interest in, in minerals. But this, it seems like legally you have incredible clarity, but um, there is in many, many groundwater districts um, a real question of whether these changes in state law and Supreme Court um, have really made any difference. Um, also, in surface water rights, the surface water rights, the state owns the water and allocates um, interests, property interests in the use of that water right. But it still can be bought and sold. It's a different kind of right than a groundwater. It's not a real private property right. It's a, a, a right of use, but it can be held in perpetuity and sold. Um, we had some real interesting skirmishes, if that's the uh, word, on uh, surface water rights and surface water in general in um, a lawsuit, which is not quite over, a federal lawsuit involving um, use of water in the Guadalupe River Basin as it affects um, an endangered population of whooping cranes. At the district court level, the district, court, uh, district judge in uh, Corpus Christi ruled against uh, the state uh, and found the state to, to have been liable for the taking the state, not, not the person pulling the water out, the state that issues those water rights liable and would have prevailed, would have put Fish and Wildlife Service as an oversight, regulatory oversight over the state of Texas uh, management um, of water rights. There were some funny things in that case, which I think some of our speakers may talk about, um, because there was a reluctance, I would call it a reluctance, in the Attorney General's briefs to use the two words water right. It was referred to as a permit, 
uh, under the rubric of state regulation and at one point I think said that the, the property interest in a surface water right in Texas is analogous to a, what's a hunting license? A hunting license. Um, there have been surface water rights in these states sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so a very, and you'll hear about that, that legal issue is not quite um, uh, resolved. But, but I conclude um, by saying we're kind of at a turning point. As states urbanize, there's, there's this tendency, I think, uh, and I consider it a kind of urban perspective that um, there's a greater public interest in the water than there is in the, pro uh, the private um, property interest in the water. And, and I think it's really unclear in what direction uh, Texas may go wh with more and more regulation, which is a limiting of the property right, or um, more um, conclusion that it's, it's a constitutional property right uh, which must be protected. It's not really a right unless the state or authorities uphold that right. Um, it may be labeled as such, but operationally is not. So I think these are big issues. I'm not sure this will be a major issue in the Texas legislature, but there's a lot of things um, unresolved about uh, Texas water law, which I think are, are very important. I'm going to give brief introductions um, of the speakers here um, with a little personal note about a couple. One, I, I want to introduce you to um, Bennett Raley, who is a lawyer in Trout Raley, Raley Trout, Rayleigh, Montano, Whitworth and Freeman in Colorado. I met uh, Bennett when I was much younger, um, in when I worked for the National Cattlemen's in Washington, D.C. She was um, five. <laughs> and we were on the property right battle and re resist the endangered species battle then, and he has remained so and is, I think, um, um, one of the leading ESA attorneys in, in the United States, um, um, without a doubt. He also served as at the federal level was um, uh, a Bush appointment as Assistant Secretary of Water in the Department of Interior involved with all kinds of complex issues about the other Colorado uh, River uh, which um, um, covers through so many states. Um, I'm, thank you very much for coming from so far, Bennett, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have you here. Molly Cagle, and I, uh, to say this in the simplest, was at, at at TCEQ for six years where you had to read these legal briefs and as you were decision maker and vote yes or no on contested permits, she's the smartest one in the pack. Uh, I had the privilege of reading all these lawyers' legal briefs for, for six years and this um, young lady was a delight and has made a great contribution um, to all kinds of um, environmental litigation including the whooping crane and she can tell you um, about that. I'd also like to uh, introduce you to Bob Harden, who is uh, vice president of his own company, Harden Associates, with um, many, many years in the hardcore science um, that involves um, all kinds of issues around water. He's particularly knowledgeable about groundwater and has seen the uh, evolution of whether it's law or um, local district issues or all of that. And so we have lots of experience from these um, fine water specialists. And I'd like to call on you, Molly, first. Sure. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and uh, I need to tell you a little, little piece of information about myself. Um, anybody here know what a doodle bugger is? Okay. My daddy was a doodle bugger, which means I grew up on the oil patch, which means I learned how to talk pretty frankly and honestly. And so, so perhaps, uh, and, and that is one of the things about my reputation and uh, probably why uh, Kathleen, is, as Chairman White, liked to make, read my briefs because they were often to, pretty. I like to think that I am still that way. Um, I, I have to say that. Um, the concept that anything that the legislature do has done has clarified the status of property rights and water rights in Texas is a little befuddling to me. Um, it's a little bit like saying that local control over groundwaters has cleared things, uh, over groundwater uh, pumping has cleared things up. I don't think either one of those are necessarily true, but I must also say that every time the Texas Supreme Court gets a hold of a surface water decision, they get some stuff right and then they get some stuff really mixed up. Um, so I'm not sure where we need to go 
um, in the immediate future to get clarity. Um, but, but it does seem that where we are these days more than anywhere is at the courthouse on surface water issues. Let me tell you a little bit about the TAP case um, because it is, it is about water, it is about an endangered species, and it is about the state and it's about the roles and the competing roles between the federal government individuals and the state government about water rights. So what is the TAP case about? Um, a group of uh, concerned citizens um, got together and decided what they really didn't want was for the uh, GBRA, the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, to sell water to a nuclear power plant in Victoria. That would be bad. It was a NIMBY action, not in my backyard. They just didn't want a nuclear power plant nearby, which is understandable. And so they got together and they said, how can we, how can we prevent this? And the conclusion was, well, the nuclear power plant was going to take 75,000 acre feet of water. That's a lot of water, just trust me on that, annually. And of course, the Guadalupe River coincides with the San Antonio River, and, and the outlet is San Antonio Bay. And that's where the hooping cranes come, and they winter there. And the hooping cranes are the iconic endangered species. They are the symbol of, the, of what's good about the Endangered Species Act. And they are a magnificent creature. And so they concluded, if you took 75,000 acre feet of water out of the, uh, the riverine system, uh, there would no longer be sufficient fresh water flows to the bay. The hooping cranes would be unhappy. You'd be harassing the hooping cranes. Voila, that's a take. Okay, pretty good theory so far. Now comes the problem. Who's taking the water? A bazillion pumpers. You've got pecan crop guys. You've got guys that are uh, raising fish. You've got farmers. You've got rice farmers. You've got industry. What a huge pain in the rear to have to file a taking claim against all of those people. I had an idea. Those water rights are issued by the TCQ. We'll sue the TCQ. And that's what they did. A very simple lawsuit. One defendant, you, the state agency who hands out water rights, you are obligated to do something so that people don't take so much water that it harms the hooping crane. Okay, meanwhile, we had Chernobyl and everything else. Exelon really folded up its tent on the, the, the impetus for this, which was the nuclear power plant. But now you've got this momentum. Now you've got an Endangered Species Act lawsuit in a remarkably favorable forum down in Judge Jack's court in Corpus Christi. So the case was tried in a freezing cold courtroom over two weeks, um, and uh, the, judge, um, the judge made some remarkable conclusions. Um, first, her first remarkable conclusion was that every single witness that was called um, by the defendants or the interveners were not believable. It's like a miracle. I mean, things don't usually quite line up that way in federal court with experienced litigators. Um, and she issued a 150-page opinion that restrained the TCQ from issuing any more water right permits, including water right permit applications that were pending. She also directed the state to participate in a, in a process under the uh, with the Fish and Wildlife to develop a conservation plan to prevent takes of hooping cranes in the future. And I want to I want to read to you um, one of the, the filings by the state of Texas that caused so much controversy in the state. Um, and that was the following. Uh, the state then sought to have the Fifth Circuit stay Judge Jack's injunction. So look, we need to appeal this, and that injunction is going to put a halt on the Texas economy like nobody's business. So please, Fifth Circuit, stay that opinion. Just stay it. We'll look at it 
doesn't make it go away, it just means it's not going to be enforced. And in order to try to get that to happen, the state filed a, a pleading with the Fifth Circuit. And in talking about what a water right is, and, and for, you know, for, for both private entities and cities and, and uh, industry that use their water rights and make, make product and sell them, uh, the state says, the effect of issuing a TCQ permit is no different from issuing a hunting license. Now, I don't know how many people here have fishing or hunting licenses, but they're darn hard to sell and trade on the open market. Um, and Parks and Wildlife would be upset if they found that that's what you were trying to do with your hunting and fishing license. In any event, uh, the Fifth Circuit did stay Judge Jack's order and, uh, and issued an opinion um, recently uh, this past summer uh, overturning her decision. The, uh, the bad guys, if you will, the, the, uh, the original citizens have now gotten together. They filed for an en banc hearing. Those of you who are not lawyers, uh, when you go to the circuit court, you get three out of the 17, 19, 15 judges that sit in that circuit, and they render a decision. But sometimes things are sufficiently important that the entire circuit will hear a case, an en banc hearing. Um, and that's voted on, as you might expect in a, in a, a private fashion. The judges will, they poll the judges, how many people think we ought to have all of us get together. Um, there were four dissenting opinions. Um, Judge Prado wrote an opinion joined by three other judges who said we should, there should be an en banc hearing granted, but a majority of the Fifth Circuit said, no, let's leave this alone, and the case will now go up to the Supreme Court. A very, very critical um, decision in terms of property rights, because if the, if the state government in what it does in terms of allocating authorizations is liable and must control the behavior of people, individuals, that are making conscious decisions about what to do with the authorization that the state has granted. It puts us in a very interesting situation. Um, and so we ought to, people ought to keep your eyes open on what happens with that hooping crane case. Um, as much as the, um, the plaintiffs in that case really want you to believe that it's about taking of the hooping cranes and protecting the hooping cranes and their lives and whether we're going to continue to have majestic endangered species and protect them, that's not what it's about. The hooping cranes are flourishing. Their population has gone up every year. If anything, um, they have done so well that they have outgrown the refuge. Um, and what we need is more land for the hooping cranes because the pairs like to have more land. Um, there are a multitude of cases that are pending before the Supreme Court or courts of appeals right now that um, will continue to uh, provide us some insight on what water rights are in the state, whether a surface water right is, uh, is something that um, uh, can be taxed, um, whether a surface water right is an encumbrance on a state-owned property, and whether a water right holder can encumber state rights. Um, and those cases uh, will probably, uh, like, like the Day case, um, uh, make it to the Supreme Court. Um, we'll find out how you value water rights, um, how you, um, and, and mostly how you encumber them for future purposes. Let me, uh, let me turn this over to talk about uh, one, one last item that, that is important. Surface water and groundwater are distinctively different except when they're not. And, and that is an important issue in the center of Texas, and here's why. The Edwards Aquifer, the beautiful Edwards Aquifer and the wonderful San Marcos Springs and the San Antonio Springs are fed by an aquifer. And the flows from the San Marcos Springs make up 
the water, the surface water that's in the Guadalupe River. And so throughout the state of Texas, you have this interesting groundwater program and surface water program, but right in the heart of Texas, um, where you have the Edwards Aquifer and you have San Antonio, a gigantic city and growing you know, by leaps and bounds. And in that particular area and where you see a lot of the litigation, like the TAP litigation and others, it's because if you think groundwater law is not clear and you know surface water law isn't quite clear, when you put them together and say that they affect each other, you really get a hell of a mess, as we would say in the oil patch. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, um, although I am before you with some disadvantages. First of all, I'm absolutely incompetent to provide you with any meaningful information on Texas water law and property rights. So I asked Kathleen as to, are you sure you want me on the panel? And she was being very gracious and said yes. The other problem I have is that I used to believe that um, with age came wisdom and I've concluded I've been cheated. <laughs> <laughs> the age, yes. The wisdom, it's escaping me. Um, I believe deeply in federalism. Part of that tells me, as well as some experience, that um, saying, in because I've had the good fortune of working in multiple states, telling one state <coughs> they should do something because another state does it, it's just flat wrong. You know, every state has been dealing with these issues in a concentrated way, and, and the law in that state on water is an intense, an intense result of a complex set of factors that you simply can't pick up from another state and move. So as I was thinking about that and in truly respecting that Texas does things differently than other states and vice versa, I was struggling to come up with, well, what might be of value to you? I have concluded over the years, though, that one can look at other states for lessons learned, for mistakes made or problems that other states have run into. There's nothing wrong with trying to figure out how to avoid problems that other states have found. And so Colorado has certainly found um, more than its share. I want to talk about those. First of all, I'm going to briefly talk about the Colorado water system. Um, actually, reality, physics, uh, the real world does control. Lawyers try to think it doesn't, but it actually does win at the end of the day. And there are basically three types of water, and all states deal with them in various ways. The first type is water on the surface that flows in rivers and is replenishable. At the other end of the spectrum is water that is static. In other words, it's like oil and gas, it moves underground, but it's in a captured zone and the replenishment of that water is on a long time period, sometimes geologic time. In the middle are what tend to be some of the greater challenging areas are groundwater that affects surface water and every state has to wrestle with that in one way or another. Colorado has done it in its own way, the deep, deep as you will, static groundwater actually is allocated with strong reference to overlying land ownership. Um, and it's done through administrative agencies in general. Courts have some involvement. Um, surface water is doctrine of prior appropriation and um, as is groundwater that is hydrologically connected to that surface water. Think of the problem, I mean, we've had in Colorado, uh, people have been fighting with shovels, guns, and lawyers over water, um, you know, for well over 100 years. And actually, the doctrine of prior appropriation in Colorado, it's very real. Water users get shut off virtually every single year. It is not, we have this right. I know, and I'm not talking about Texas, I'm talking about another state in the West. The doctrine of prior appropriation in that state means that you get shut down to your uh, identified permit amount. No, in Colorado, we're just short and we have a lot of people. So uh, for 100 years, 
uh, people get shut off, and they get shut off in reverse order uh, without respect to whether it is an ag or an urban area. So the doctrine of prior appropriation, relatively pure, uh, that's, I hate to use that term because I don't mean um, a moral sense to it, but it's pretty straightforward. Same with tributary groundwater. And the courts and the legislature have drawn a line to say, all right, basically a well that's on the bank of a river. I mean, when we've had this many conflicts over surface water, uh, we, our water users, like yours, are very smart. And if they could punch a well um, and take groundwater that was 10 feet from the river and say that's groundwater and doesn't affect surface rights, they've done it and tried. And so Colorado's had to deal with that. Um, so, you know, system, actually, more commonalities than, than people would assume to, to what Texas has done, based on my limited knowledge. Uh, a couple of things that are unique, some of which, I mean, I'm skeptical they're uh, relevant to you, but I'll let you make that decision. Um, our system is uh, heavily judicial. In other words, the confirmation of the right of appropriation, you've got to go to court. I'm not a particular fan of that, which one might wonder coming from a lawyer. Uh, here's why. You let lawyers work on something very long and you've gone way past the reasonable zone. We now have, this summer I had a four-day trial over th three acre feet of water maximum depletion a year. Now it's in a very dry basin, so yeah, a lot of conflict, but four days of trial with all the discovery and everything else over three acre feet, I'm sorry. I don't think that's good public policy, uh, but it is. That's the way our system is. A second example is, and I think it's actually more uh, systemic, is we have to go to water court to confirm rights or to deal with conflicts and surface rights and connected groundwater um, all the time. Um, our system is to the point where you don't get there without some pretty complex groundwater modeling. You all know about that. Or surface water modeling, you know about that as well. Well, guess what? Even in sort of minor cases, the modeling's down to the third and fourth decimal points. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, and I attribute that to the lawyers and with all due respect, the engineers who look at this and go, oh, well, we'll just get more precise and more precise, losing sight of the fact that that um, the real world will never be able to deal with the nuance between the third and fourth decimal point. So I point to that as um, something that um, I hope you're not there and if you, or, or that you can avoid. On the other hand, this, you know, Colorado doesn't have much choice. It has to have a judicial driven surface water <laughs> allocation system for this reason. Historically, because we did not have good, the foresight of um, joining the union uh, on our own terms, we have massive amounts of federal land. And we have dealt with for years, as has much of the West, with federal claims to water. Well, it used to be that the federal claims to water, given the supremacy clubs, were, well, there are claims, and yeah, you've got your silly state water law, but we're not going to bother with that. We're not subject to it. Well, in the 50s, Congress enacted the McCarran Amendment, which is a waiver of sovereign immunity, which allows um, water users that are adjudicating the rights, respective rights in the priority system, to bring the feds in and make them subject to the decree. We couldn't function without that in most, if not all, of our major surface water basins because of the pervasive presence of federal claims, whether it's reserved water rights or other sort of claims. Um, if we didn't have a judicial system, and McCarran only makes the, um, the feds subject to those state courts, it, it, McCarran only works if you've got a judicial system. So we're kind of forced, because of our lack of foresight when we joined the union, um, to have a judicial system. I will be interested to watch. I understand that um, you have the misfortune of having a large number of, of candidate species um, that were identified in the um, Sweetheart Settlement with the Enviros for, for being listed and critical habitat. I, I'm always interested to watch when, because obviously the ESA, in my view, is the greatest threat to Westwide to the property rights and water rights. And, and so far, 
um, we've been unsuccessful in forcing the federal demands to be met within that priority system. But, you know, the, the adjudication system and, and opportunity to do that, th that's why I went through Colorado's messy process, is that um, we've not given up and we have a constant battle with the federal government to try to force its, de to claim its demands in priority. So, you know, our system um, is, like I said, it's got some similarities to yours. Uh, I, let me pull back a moment and not focus on the federal government. The uh, market that we have for water, there's two types. First of all, there's the district that I've represented for years. You can, it's a federal project and the water can be rented or sold between ag and urban entities the, um, for virtually no administrative costs. The government doesn't get involved in that transfer or in the approvals are very, very rarely withheld. So you have that market. We also have a, a vibrant market in um, water rights, appropriative water rights that are bought and sold. And you know what? We, ha we couldn't survive without those markets. First of all, I don't think you can have a market without a property right. I'm kind of old-fashioned in that respect. <laughs> and our property right-driven market is essential not only to deal with growth, but also to deal with shortage. Because we, having being largely a surface water uh, driven systems, uh, when we deal with severe drought, and we're in the middle of them uh, in a couple of basins, very severe drought, people need to know what rights they have and what they don't for predictability purposes. So we couldn't function, or at least it wouldn't, it would be chaos in, in my view, without the property rights that are uh, created by our water supplies. Uh, I'm sorry, our water system. Let me close by. Uh, well, first of all, I want to compliment you on your victory in the TAP case. Thank About you. five, seven years ago, we did an informal opinion on what we called vicarious liability of a permitting agency for take under the Endangered Species Act. So we eagerly have been reading everything that you've done. And I've, you've had one of the few real victories. We in Colorado, and, and actually in, in my limited experience elsewhere, you know, as you deal with surface water, ESA, water rights uh, conflicts, you know what, you've got some places you can look at for things to avoid and lessons learned. The Upper Colorado, the South Platte program, which as I said earlier, I wish you'd keep or eat the whooping crane because we have to deal with them when they pass through Colorado. <laughs> um, sorry. Tastes and like chicken. There, then there's the Middle Rear Grand, the horror story of the Bay Delta, um, you've got uh, the San Juan, the Middle Colorado, the Lower Colorado, um, the West itself has got a number of places that you can go to as you deal with your water rights and property rights in the ESA, and, and none of them are one size fits all. But you can go to those experiences um, to try to avoid some of the mistakes because um, while you led the way on conflicts um, with groundwater in the Edwards Aquifer, and you're dealing with it with surface water, uh, you're not the only one that have been in the ESA hell. So thank you for your patience. We're going to uh, take some questions now, and I just might, um, um, before we do so, provide a little context. Um, the kind of foundational law um, that guides a lot of, of Texas water decisions, um, we still refer to as Senate Bill 1, as the planning um, um, statute. And it recognized how important it was that Texas prepare for a much higher water demand in the future um, that would be able to sustain, you know, about the most rapidly growing population in the United States and the most robust economy. And that, that law, in my opinion, it's in, I think, the first couple paragraphs of the law says, uh, rec recognizing that we need a greater water supply to meet those demands in the future or now during acute drought, that that, that those issues, scarce water scarcity, would be addressed by voluntary redistribution of existing supplies. That's the wordy 
phrase in the statute. That assumes a water market, and that's why you know, this panel and the issues are, are so important. I think a, ref, a, a, a reflection that there are, are, is a lot of legal fuzziness in by, you know, what I call the, the scope or the nature of the water right is because we don't really have a vibe. The market, the vibrant markets in, in water um, that would reduce also the cost of water development on public institutions that would be driven um, by private players or quasi-public uh, uh, private river authorities has never really happened in, except I'd say in two areas of Texas. One, and therefore largely temporary uh, sales or rents, um, one is in the Edwards Aquifer area, but although highly regulated, more so than, than other, um, but it's clear, it clarified. Mm -hmm. People know what they're buying and selling. And, and the others in the lower Rio Grande where a court actually long disputed uh, established a different system than the pure prior appropriation, which is first in time. Um, so these things are still very, I mean, they're very alive, and, they, and to anyone um, concerned about um, whether water use in a, a particular industry like the um, oil and gas industry or just uh, the future of Texas, um, and we got some, some very good reminders in, in the uh, long, harsh droughts in certain part of the state. So I just wanted to set that context, but we'll take questions now of the panelists. <laughs> <coughs> a question for uh, Mr. Harden. I'm looking at your map. Um, coming back a long time ago when the de definition of a USDW was made, 10,000 TDS level, mm -hmm. I wanted to know what that represents. Does that represent to 10,000 TDS? Even though you know where the definition came from, it's very subjective, 10,000 TDS. And you also, you know, between 3 and 10,000, Texas didn't protect for a long time with surface pipe. And so you know that that 3 to 10,000, uh, when you look at crops and you look at vegetation, it doesn't grow anything. So I'm just curious about what that represents and the complexity it makes when you got this kind of definition. Yeah. Mostly those aquifer boundaries on that map are down to 3,000 TDS. So the 10,000 would be just short distance deeper, if you will, in each of those. And, and you might explain what TDS means uh, in this Total respect. dissolved solids, it's a uh, degree of salinity or saltiness. Our, our drinking water has to be, state standard is 1,000 milligrams per liter or less. So we're talking about brackish groundwater at 3,000 TDS or saline water at 10,000 TDS. And Even though it's required to be protected, by the way. Yeah. You can drink it. I'll More give you questions? The runs. Uh, what I got, there's a, there's a clear distinction in the legal rights between surface water and groundwater. And I'm not clear, can you clarify for me that where groundwater becomes surface water, particularly in the area of a spring that discharges constantly, or a windmill that runs all the time and overflows, when, when does that groundwater that comes from beneath the surface become surface water, or does it? Um. I'll take that and, and you know the answer because I'm a good lawyer is it depends um, but um, and and the uh, I, I think that was the issue in the day case was the if if you've got groundwater and you pump it up except in the Edwards okay let's put the Edwards aside because I think it's probably treated differently you can take your groundwater and you can actually discharge it into a river I'm gonna take it down 20 miles, but you do have to go get an authorization from the TCQ. <coughs> the molecules will clearly commingle, but you've got to go get an authorization to dibs it, because if you don't dibs it, when your groundwater is produced, if you attempt to store it or you in any way commingle it with surface water, it becomes surface water unless you have dibs it first. But what about a spring then that discharges constantly? What do I have to do there? Uh, well, a spring would, I mean, uh, once in the history of the TCQ did the, did the um, TCQ ever declare an aquifer an underground river? Um, and that was the Edwards, and it was declared an underground river, and there were a bunch of rules because, because of the problem about sticking a well in right, right upstream or, or to interfere with the spring. I mean, I think the answer is that spring flow, once it is 
out of the ground and it's spring flow, it's surface water and it belongs to the, the state unless you, you know, I mean, you could build a little pond and it would be privately held, wouldn't commingle with state water. But as a general rule, once, once water springs from an aquifer, it becomes state water. I've got a question for Mr. Horton real quickly on his, uh, just on the map. <clears throat> we were in a discussion earlier. We're not trying to figure out on the white and looking at your scale, is the white somewhere around 50% or is that unknown what's in the white area? That, this map is only the major aquifer, so that's just where the major aquifers don't exist. So it is unknown what's in that area? Well, I wouldn't say unknown. There, there, there are minor aquifers in some of those areas. Like uh, the Blaine and the Dockham, there's just different aquifers in the white. But generally speaking, West Texas, you're going to get into areas where you don't really have usable aquifers. Okay, but if we, to help with that map, would it be possible to contact your firm and buy, or something that would have an overlay of counties on that? That sure. would be helpful. Yeah. That'd be possible. Sure. Okay, great. Any more? I understand that in Texas there are four called private rivers or privately owned rivers. What's the legal distinction of that? They're non-navigable non in terms of usage. I don't, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't, I, I, For I've instance, heard. the James River uh, is called, there was an article in the paper anyway that said it was one of the four privately owned rivers in Texas. <laughs> where the landowners own the rivers. It's, uh, that's got to be a bed and banks distinction of who owns the land that underlies the water course. Okay. Uh, that, that must so it be has nothing to do with the water. It should not. That once you channel under Texas water law, once you've channeled water, you know, you've got sheet flow running across the hillside. That's not, that's not state water yet. But once it gets into a water course, um, then it becomes state water. And my guess is that it's simply a reference to the Spanish land grants as to who owns the bed and banks and the, the bottom of the river. Um, and, but in that case, you recall that I said if you, if you had groundwater and you were going to commingle it with state water, um, you might get into some interesting questions because the, the, it's the authorization to use the bed and banks that the state owns to transport your groundwater. Well, if the state doesn't own the bed and banks, it's, it's a very odd authorization to get from them. Quiet group. You see how, how quickly um, water policies become technical. The layers, and I, and I mentioned this because, um, and the quickly moves from complex legal distinctions to very complex engineering distinctions. And um, it's a difficult, in my experience, it's difficult issues for our legislature. Um, and there was a time when there were some um, really uh, highly informed, they were kind of the water folks in the legislature. And, and we've kind of, we've kind of missed those. So these are, these are difficult issues for our legislature. <coughs> Just for clarification for myself, you're talking about state waters? I thought those were waters of the United States that under federal government, if they're, you know, how it's defined in waters of the United States, it's very difficult to understand in lots of places, including marshes and everything else in the world, where water runs. But when you say states, though, you're under federal too, as well, right? Uh, the feds don't, the feds have no interest under the Clean Water Act of, over groundwater. They're talking about surface. Surface water is, under the Clean Water Act, it's waters of the U.S. for purposes of water quality protection. It's state water for purposes of ownership and water rights. The state has no, the feds, other than the encroachment through the Endangered Species Act and environmental flows, the feds don't have any interest in the ownership of the surface water. So. Bennett, do you want to make a 
a comment on that? At least not in Texas. No, that's that's the true in Colorado. The, the waters of the United States is for other purposes. The state water um, is defined for purposes of property rights. Over time, we have all seen attempts by the federal agencies to use the Clean Water Act. I mean, I identified the ESA as the greatest threat, but we have seen and actually we're going through uh, one right now with the Waters of the United States rulemaking, um, there have been overt attempts over the years to use the Federal Clean Water Act and the Waters of the United States that you refer to to get at quantity, water quantity allocations. Those have been relatively unsuccessful uh, except when you have the bad circumstance of where you have to get a federal permit. I mean, our because of our pervasive in Colorado and other western states federal presence, we can't really touch much in the way of large water courses without getting a federal permit. And so we've had, you know, longer than I exist, battles over the extent to which that federal authority for that nominally Congress identified for Clean Water Act purposes can be used to get at water quantity and that battle will never go away. It's just that the ESA has been such an easier tool. Mm -hmm. The attention has shifted away from the Clean Water Act, but it too is a threat. I, I hope a takeaway, and uh, my intention was, is, um, you know, we move again with the, ro the nature of property rights in water. There are plenty of people, and there may be well be in this room, that think that's, that's morally wrong. That water, as something necessary for human life, you know, should be allocated by um, government decisions and not uh, the private owners of water. But everything, you know, we we um, advocate at um, TPPF, and I think what history shows us is that um, there there's markets in water um, can actually provide more public goods than state allocation, political allocation, if you will of water. And I think that's an important issue in Texas as we've become used to be, an, I think, kind of an assumption when this was largely a agrarian, as they call you, or um, rural dominated state. But it's not with them um, uh, now at this. And I, I am struck by Colorado um, where they have dealt with scarcity issues more <laughs> earlier and, and re more regularly. Is that fair to say? That than this state has. All, all these things are really sort of just interesting to think about unless you ha tell you have real scarcity or competing uses of water. And I was always struck that um, uh, while Colorado has, you know, as we, t as, as Bennett said, you know, their litigation is, is an ongoing thing. They have their own water courts. I don't know quite how they work, but I've heard they have. But they have stuck to their, their prior population system um, and, and, and water markets um, persist. So I, I hope Texas, um, to me, has a, uh, a lesson to learn about that and that what we've seen in history in the manner in which markets can work um, to uh, reach such levels of productivity as well as, you know, uh, prudence, the owner, own, owner's incentive to preserve, not to um, extinguish what he owns. I think, I uh, really hope that this issue in Texas will go on and on. Nothing happens in a 24-hour period, but I think it's really important to all our other issues, policy issues in the state. So thank you all very much for coming. And I believe lunch is about um, on the table.